Okay, sorry to make another video so soon. I'm hoping to put a nail in the coffin of this, um, what do you want to call it? Uneducated debate by those who think that they're the true Israel, which is another version of preterism. Essentially, the preterism doctrine holds that because Israel rejected Christ at the cross, the church takes over all of Israel's covenants. So that when the covenant is made in the book of Hebrews, it's made to what they consider true Israel, which of course is them. Now these people who think that they replace Israel have many different names in Christendom. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling to me how jealous people are of the Jews. For no reason whatsoever. They call themselves Christian identity, they call themselves by other names, but they all are basically saying, Hi, all those are promises in the Old Testament. Don't really go to the Jews, or, well, you see, they really do go to the Jews, but we're the Jews, not the other people. Okay? And because of this, they make all kinds of really stupid mistakes with scripture. The minute you become anti-Semitic, and anti means instead of, not necessarily against. So if you want to say you're the real Jews instead of the Jews, you're anti-Semitic. Anybody who's anti-Semitic makes some incredibly stupid mistakes about scripture that is even properly translated and in front of you is Two are two of those passages on the right so you don't make mistakes like the anti-semites do on the right 2 Samuel 7 that's a promise to David from God it's unconditional it says and I'm using the NASB translation use whatever you want when your days are complete, meaning when he's going to be dying, which is age 77, not 70, and you lie down with your fathers, <clears throat> I will what? Raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, meaning he will have David's genes in his blood. David's genes. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. This is dual entendre because Solomon is also going to do this. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And then this is talking about the kings in between Messiah and, and uh, David. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of iron and the strokes from the sons of men. Strokes means blows not stroking your hand. But my loving kindness, that's Hebrew chesed, shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul from whom I removed before you. See, Saul was supposed to be the first. He was he, the promise that David got, Saul originally got. It's real important to know. As I took it away from Saul from whom I removed before you. Now here it comes, look real carefully on the right hand side. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. See? Now David, unlike modern scholars, understood that there were two kingships. The one who's going to be coming from his loins, Messiah, is going to wear two hats, two crowns, two kingdoms. One of those crowns was going to be king of the Jews. Because the Jews lose their inheritance owing to what? Wanting Saul. So they lost out on their sharing in the promises made to Abram, Moses, and so God replaced the promises that were going to be fulfilled to Israel by grafting in David. It, 
They rejected God as king, so God appoints Saul and made the same promise to Saul as he's now making to David. And Saul said no, so then God grafted in David. This is not too hard to understand. Now notice, by grafting in David and making the promise now run through David and not Israel, then the promises to Israel go through David so if there is a king right here of the Jews, first hat, if there is a king of the Jews, then that king, one person, will inherit all of the promises. So what do we have Paul explain on the left hand side of the screen? Now the promises were spoken to Abram and his seed, singular, which is what Paul's saying. We know it's not interpretation. He's saying right here, he does not say and to seeds, referring as to many, but rather to one and your seed, that is Christ. The left hand side of the screen and the right hand side of the screen are talking about the same thing. That's what Paul's talking about there. Christ vested in all the Old Testament covenants as a Jew, as a king of the Jews. So that hat he wore as Jew, king of the Jews, all those promises are, you know, as it were, vested in him, not in anyone else. Repeat, not in anyone else. So replacement theology has zero basis whatsoever. Anyone trying to call himself a true Jew because, oh, you know, we're really the true Jews and the bloodline came down through us and the Jews that call themselves Jews really aren't Jews. Uh, excuse me, the whole argument is completely irrelevant due to what you're seeing in blue on the screen. The promise is vested in Christ. Now, Christ, however, has two kingdoms, which I've already shown okay in my co in the preterism videos and I've shown it in many other videos in the series I'm gonna go through the book of Hebrews line by line but that's gonna be like 2015 2016 if I live that long the Kata Melchizedek priesthood is a separate priesthood that has nothing to do with Israel it has to do with Satan the replacement is of the demons not of the Jews the demons fell. That's why Satan lost his title as Morning Star and became titled as Satan, which means opposing attorney. And Christ takes away the title from Satan and becomes the Morning Star. And that Morning Star is Star of the Womb, Star of the Morning. I think I did a video on that showing how it really means Day Star. Christ gets the title per Psalm 110 from Satan. Morning Star title. That's what Psalm 110 is for. Okay, so it's referencing a second kingship. That is what Paul says in Ephesians, but he's relying on the reader to already know what he's saying here in Galatians. So the book of Hebrews came out to elaborate on what Paul's saying here in the book of Galatians. Left hand side of the screen, Galatians 3.16. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. So Christ already vested in all the covenants to Israel. They are held by him. If you want to be a replacement theology person and cut out the Jews, you are basically spitting on Christ, cutting him off, saying that his work on the cross didn't mean anything. I don't think that's what you mean to say. And that, the left-hand side of the screen, is the fulfillment of the right-hand side of the screen, 2 Samuel 7.16. His throne is established forever. That's why the book of Hebrews is written to call your attention to these two verses. So our covenant as church is coming from a separate kingdom to Christ based on his victory over the demons, not based on the Jews at all. 
He, however, has two hats. That's where it's a little bit confusing. He has his King of the Jews hat, and the kingdom is of the Jews when they will be Queen of the Nations in the Millennium, because that promise is made to Christ. The time is owed to Christ. That's why Moses reserved the thousand years in the first 84 syllables of Psalm 90. He's saying that it's reserved to Christ. And all the other writers picked up on it in the Hebrew meter. But Christ has two kingdoms, not one. He is a king over two kingdoms, not one. Kind of roughly analogous to the Queen of England being both the Queen of England and the Queen of Scotland and Britain. Or the Queen of the Commonwealth, which includes a lot of other nations besides England. She's got two hats. She's Queen of the Commonwealth and she's Queen of England. This isn't too hard to understand. Royalty has often had more than one crown. You're the King of Place A and you're also the King of Place B. Okay, Place B has its own rules, its own location. Church is not a single national entity. Israel was. There are a thousand differences between our covenant and theirs. But the same king is the king over them, as is the king over us. The person is the same. The kingdoms are separate. And any Jew who believes in Christ during the time of church until the pre-tribulation rapture, which I've been proving now for 11 years, the information might be new to you or unknown, but I've been documenting it for 11 years, 12 years. The kingship that he has over Israel is separate from the kingdom of church. And any Jew who believes between now and the pre-tribulational rapture, which kicks off the time that's owed to the Jews via Christ, well, that's going to play because it's owed to him. I don't know. Can I make it? I, I keep trying to make videos demonstrating this very obvious truth. And some of it, you know, is really sophisticated, and yes, you have to look at the Greek. But what you're seeing on screen is not sophisticated. To your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Yeah, that's king of the Jews. Left-hand side, referencing all the covenants in the Old Testament. Not many seeds, but to one Christ. So... If you're a replacement theologian, you're claiming you replace Christ. I don't think that's what you mean to say. Okay? So the Jews have their promises vested in Christ, so they cannot lose them. Nobody else can get them. The person to whom they were made, right here, is Christ. End of discussion about whether you replace the Jews or not because the Jew you think you're replacing is really Christ see he says so right here so you don't want to be a replacement theologian idiot and the reason there is a preacher of rapture is because the time and all the promises many of which are yet future are to Christ we have a separate covenant in Christ not theirs and our covenant is better. That's a Greek, Attic Greek word, krytone. And it's said over and over in the book of Hebrews. So, you know, I can't make those videos right now in the book of Hebrews to show it. But you could read the translation over 9,000 times, or better still read it in the Greek. And you would get this. Our priesthood does not derive from the Jews. Christ is not of the right tribe. That's in Hebrews 7 through 10. It's a different covenant. It is used to inaugurate the new covenant to the Jews, but it isn't the new covenant to the Jews. It's the new covenant to church, which any Jew can get into simply by believing that Christ is the Messiah. And he'll probably be mixed up and still think he has to practice the Mosaic law. But that doesn't matter. He's still in the body of Christ, and he's still part of Christ, and he's still part of church. And then God will straighten him out on the doctrines he's getting wrong. So see, please, final nail in the coffin is showing on your screen. He does not say, and to seeds, 
He says to your seed that is Christ. So, as far as I'm concerned, this video is over. But I'm going to make one more quick clarification because this was confusing even to me when I first read it. What I'm saying is this. The law that came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. Previously ratified. So as to nullify the promise. Okay? Inheritance is not based on the law. That's what he's saying, see? If inheritance is based on the law, it's no longer based on promise. But God gave it to Abraham by means of a promise. This is what the book of Hebrews elaborates on. This is kind of like where the, the jumping off point. Okay, what does it mean 430 years later? 430 years after the seed of Abram, namely Jacob, entered Egypt. See, he's making wordplay here. The promises to Abraham was spoken to his seed singular. Okay, the seed of Abraham was Isaac. The seed of Isaac, who inherited the promise, was Jacob, not Esau. One seed. Okay. And Jacob entered Egypt, and 430 years later, Israel as a nation went out. That's when the law was promulgated, because Israel became a nation. He started out as one guy, Israel having been named Jacob at birth. Chisler is what Jacob means, manipulator. Israel, of course, means prince of God. Okay, the promise was made to just Jacob. And then he had a lot of kids. But the promise to Jacob was that this kid would be born from his loins. And so Israel went into slavery. 30 years actually after they entered Egypt. That's where the 400 is coming from. It's literally 30, 390 years um, under Pharaoh. And another 10 years God is counting for um, the 10 years of slavery Joseph had. And that's all datelined by Moses in uh, Psalm, Psalm 90 verses um, 1 through 3. 63 sevens. He's writing 63 sevens after um, Israel slavery. So, honey, 430 years after Jacob entered Egypt was the Exodus. That's Exodus 12, verses 40 through 41. Okay? That doesn't invalidate a previous covenant. Well, there were several covenants prior to Israel's existence. One of them was Psalm 110. So, God's combining, here's what's confusing, God's combining two kingships in one person. This one. We don't get the covenant that Israel got. We don't get the kingdom Israel got. We got a separate deal for Satan beating the angels. And that's what Psalm 110 tells you. He literally gets the title of born from the morning star. The Greek is a lot clearer about this than the Hebrew is. Of course, the Hebrew is using wordplay. That's why. But in the Greek text, it says, Born from the morning star, he gets his kids. So that's it. If it didn't help, yell at me. I don't know what else to do.